Only in America. 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 This week, we're finishing off our Immigrant Youth series, and well, our third season of Only in America, with a view from outside the U.S. For people who are, who are going with smugglers, if you have money, you're going to travel faster, you're going to travel, you know, safer, but that is not the case for most of the boys. So they are trying to cross into Croatia or Hungary or Romania, hidden in uh, cargo vehicles, hidden in freezers, sometimes in gas tanks. Uh, hidden under the buses or under the trains, you know, holding on under the train for hours and hours. Or just by walking, you know, walking and then hoping that you're not going to be intercepted by the police and beaten and pushed back. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani and this is Only in America. In our final series of 2020, we focused on the experiences of immigrant youth in the United States, the trauma they face both before and after arriving, the stigmas they grapple with, and the challenges that they're overcoming. Well, this week on Only in America, we're zooming out from our US-centric approach to get a glimpse of the challenges migrant youth face in other parts of the world. Now look, migration is as much a global challenge as it is a global opportunity. With nearly 80 million people forcibly displaced and 26 million refugees, the numbers are staggering. Particularly when you look at the 2018 United Nations data that points to nearly 31 million children that have been forcibly displaced worldwide. From Honduras and El Salvador to Syria and Afghanistan, young people are fleeing violence and poverty for a better life. They're traveling thousands of miles by foot and by bus in the hands of smugglers to send money back to their families. Even when they survive the dangerous journey to a safer country, they often face significant barriers in the form of harsh policies and local hostility. When destination countries like the US and those in the European Union enact restrictive policies, they're only driving these vulnerable people further into the shadows. As we've seen time and again, deterrence does not work when people are fleeing impossible situations. It just outsources our immigration systems to the hands of cartels and smugglers. Ultimately, migration is a global issue that requires global solutions. And the more that we can learn from case studies from across the world, the better we can understand why people move, how host countries adapt, and how we can create safer and more sustainable communities for all. As we near the end of 2020, our team wants to thank you for your support of Only in America. If you like what we are putting out on the podcast, we'd love for you to consider supporting our work as we prepare for season four. In this season of giving, the National Immigration Forum is trying to raise $10,000 by the end of the year. You can help us reach our goal at immigrationforum.org. Thank you. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. And from Humanity United. When humanity is united, we can bring a powerful force for human dignity. To See Each Other is a documentary series that complicates the narrative about rural Americans in our most misunderstood and often abandoned communities. Host George Goal, a leading grassroots organizer, travels to Michigan, Iowa, New Jersey, North Carolina, and Indiana to reveal how small town folks are working together in fights for everything from clean water and racial justice to immigration rights and climate change. The show believes that when we see each other, we'll understand that we can never give up on each other. Subscribe to To See Each Other wherever you're listening to this show. My guest today is Irena Abdelalem Abdelmakshud. Irena works at Infopark, a grassroots NGO in Belgrade, Serbia, that has been assisting refugees in the area since 2015. Belgrade is a major transit hub for refugees making their arduous journey to the European Union. They currently provide urgent aid, 
psychological support, accommodation, information, and other services for refugees across Belgrade. Irena is a protection officer who specializes in working with unaccompanied and separated children. The daughter of refugees from Croatia, she's passionate about helping others who have been forced to flee from their home in search of a better life. Amid the ongoing refugee crisis that first gained international attention in 2015, Irena has seen the attitudes toward these children and families change, and how compassion and openness has dissipated as the refugee crisis has become a chronic challenge for communities across the world. Irena and I spoke about how Infopark is assisting young refugees, the parallels between the policies in Europe and those of the U.S.-Mexico border, and why she's dedicated to advocating for young immigrants. Irena, thank you so much for joining. I am really looking forward to this conversation. And before we talk about the substance of the work that you do every day, please, if you don't mind, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? How do you find yourself in your position these days? So I grew up in Serbia. I was actually born in Croatia and I came to Serbia as a refugee because my parents, they were refugees. I was just a baby. I was one when I came here. So I Lucky enough for me, you know, fortunately, I don't remember the war in the 90s that was happening in the Balkans, but I do remember growing up as a refugee. So, you know, I know how it, how it can feel. I know what are some of the challenges. I know that sometimes you will be discriminated and things like this. So when I was, because I went to university uh, and I went to faculty of languages, I studied Arabic language. And in 2015, I was at beginning my final year at university to actually be an Arabic professor, of professor of Arabic language and culture and literature. So that was when the refugee crisis started, actually, in Serbia, when, you know, we had hundreds of thousands of people, mostly from Syria at that time, going through Serbia, because Serbia was a transit country. So for me, I just wanted to help any way I could, you know. It was basic translating, mostly for NFI, you know, do you need clothes, shoes, things like this, because people were just spending from 30 minutes to a couple of hours in Belgrade before they would continue their journey to, you know, Western Europe. So I started as a volunteer. Um, Infopark started as a grassroots initiative. It was We were just a group of, you know, locals who just wanted to help any way we could. And then as the situation changed, I also had a chance to learn a lot and to specialize in my area. And I've been here now, you know, for more than five years, five and a half years almost. Wow. Do you think you'll you'll ever become a professor or is this, is this your life's uh, calling? Uh, honestly, I think maybe sometime in the future when I'm, when I have a bit more patience, you know, when I, when I can take it to sit and look at the papers all day in the office, maybe, <laughs> but right now, no, I like, you know, being on the move and I like being uh, this kind of job, unpredictable yeah. and everything that comes with it. Tell me a little bit about the community that you're, you're seeing in Belgrade these days. When it comes to refugee community, refugee and migrant community in Belgrade, things have changed a lot since beginning, since 2015, when the borders were open and we had mostly people coming from Syria and Iraq, and then a bit less from Afghanistan, when there were mostly families, when people coming from Syria and Iraq, they were mostly Arabs, and then when the borders closed and when different things happened in their own countries, countries of origin, so the population also changed. We have now people who are coming from Syria, Iraq are mostly minorities there, you know, Yazidi and Kurdish people. We have a lot more Afghans, a lot more Pakistanis. We have people coming from North Africa, like from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. We have unaccompanied boys from Egypt or first from Somalia. So we try to follow trends to see, because whenever you have some, some things, you know, changing in their countries of origin or some new things happening, you know that after a few months, you're going to have a wave of of refugees coming from that from that place. Uh, maybe if you, I am not sure how much how much you're familiar with the whole Balkan route, the whole Balkan migration crisis in Europe. Please, yeah, you know, describe that if you, if you don't mind. So right now we have mostly people from, as I said, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, and Iraq. Mostly families, Kurdish and Yazidi. We have people from Iran, North Africa, and Central Africa. And because Serbia is a transit country, most of these people want to reach Western Europe, want to reach countries like Germany, France, Belgium, people who are looking for a better life, safer life. So Serbia is just a transit country. People who are here are stuck because we are right on the border with the European Union countries like Croatia, Romania, and so on. So people are in Serbia just, you know, as long as it takes for them to cross and continue further. 
And right now, the only way to go legally from Serbia, and that was actually good news that we received this morning, is, is through Hungarian list. And that was something that was established a bit after the, the borders were officially closed in 2016, because the borders were open for refugees coming from the Middle East from 2015 till March 2016. And then when the borders were cl- uh, closed completely, the only way to continue further legally was through Hungarian list. So you could come to Serbia as new arrival, go to the one of the asylum or reception centers, and then you could apply for this list. And in the beginning, Hungarian authorities, they were accepting 30 people per day, and then 20, and then 10, and then for the last year and a half, they were, th- they were accepting like one person per day. Hmm. And in, in March 2020, they stopped completely until... Until this week, with coronavirus and everything, they, they stopped completely. So that basically means if you are a refugee and you reach Serbia and you don't have money to pay smugglers, you don't have any other legal way to go, so you can just come to the camp, register, and then wait for who knows how long, sometimes two, three years. We have people who've been waiting here for more than three years. you know. And then there are rumors of names and places on the list being sold, you know, so you are basically waiting. You're not sure what you're waiting for. When is your turn? Because only commissariat for, for refugees and migration in Serbia, they're the governmental body managing the migration in Serbia. So they're the only ones who have the lists and who know when when is who crossing the border. And also, you know, when you when you reach Hungary, we had families from Afghanistan who were pushed back from Hungary. You know, they were, they were accepted into the transit camp. The only solution for them was to seek asylum there. And then they were given the decision that they don't have no idea, they have no right to seek asylum in Hungary. And then they were pushed back to Serbia. They returned to Serbia. So if you want to go legally, it's a long wait. There's a lot of you know uncertainties. You're not sure what's going to happen when you reach Hungary or no. So unfortunately, that leaves most of the people uh, looking for illegal ways to, to continue further. The smuggling has been blooming in Serbia. And as an NGO who was who is present in the field, you know, Belgrade is a center for, for all information and, and smuggling and everything. We see, we see smugglers operating daily. We know how they're taking people. We know, you know, which ways they're taking them, how much is the price for certain countries, certain borders, certain way of transportation. And that is, you know, something that's been happening daily. And then over time, how has the age profile of the the refugee population there changed? As I mentioned in the beginning, most of the people coming going through Serbia were were families actually, and then single men from Afghanistan. But nowadays we have much more unaccompanied and separated children coming from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Iran, from Syria and Iraq than than before. Also, religious minorities in that case. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Yazidi, Kurdish, mm-hmm. even some people who are like Amaziri from uh, from Morocco, Berbers from Morocco, or even Christian communities from Egypt. Yeah. And then, so how, as an organization, how are you helping the unaccompanied and separated children? And what kind of services are, are you providing? And you know, what do you, what do you see you know within that community? So we work with different categories of unaccompanied and separated children. We work with new arrivals, so we identify them, we refer them to social workers, outreach social workers. We provide them food, we accompany them if they need a doctor or to be taken to hospital, or if we need to cover you know, medical expenses for the treatment, for things like this, if we need to cover the cost of transportation from Belgrade to the center. This is for new arrivals, if they need police registration, NFI, things like this. As I said, because everyone wants to continue further, they, you know, they go to the borders and they get stopped by the police and pushed back. So we work also with pushbacks from the borders daily. And in those cases, often we work with kids who were victims of physical violence. So they also need, you know, doctor urgent accommodation. They need to be accompanied to the social workers if they need to talk to a psychologist or psychosocial support or things like this. So new arrivals, pushbacks from the borders, and because in Belgrade you have, in like near Belgrade, you have two two centers, asylum and reception center, where people can come and go daily. With those people, we have two empowerment programs. For One is for adolescent refugee boys, and one is for women and girls. So with those people, we can do workshops, we can do different classes, we can, you know, before Corona and everything, we could go to 
have different activities, get involved with local communities and things like that. So I wanted to ask, how are, you know, let's say, you know, a, an unaccompanied separate child from, from Pakistan, how are they making it to Serbia? I mean, that's, that's a bit of a trip. It's a long way, yeah. Yeah. So when we talk about, uh, because most of the unaccompanied separate children are boys, adolescent boys who are, most of them are either sent by their families to, you know, reach Europe and then work and send money back to their families especially when they need to, you know, pay back the smugglers and everything, or those were children who were were homeless or, you know, living on the streets and then tried to escape for safety. So standard, like standard route is if you go from Afghanistan, you're going to go to through Pakistan, Turkey, Iran, Turkey, and then Greece or Bulgaria to reach Serbia. And it's all in essence by bus. No, you have you can you have parts of the road where you go by bus. You have parts of the road where you go by a taxi or another vehicle arranged by smuggler. You have many like parts of the the journey where you go by walk by foot. And then from Serbia also you try to continue. You know because most of the the unaccompanied boys they they don't have any money with them. So the ways they are trying to cross with smugglers are very risky. Because smugglers, if you have money, you can cross. They can make for you fake documents. You can cross. You know different ways. As I said, you know, for people who are who are going with smugglers, if you have money, you're going to travel faster, you're going to travel, you know, safer. But that is not the case for most of the boys. So they are t- trying to cross into Croatia or Hungary or Romania, hidden in uh, cargo vehicles, hidden in freezers, sometimes in gas tanks, uh, hidden under the buses or under the trains, you know, holding on under the train for hours and hours, or just by walking, you know, walking and then hoping that you're not going to be intercepted by the police and beaten and pushed back. And I, I ask because, you know, here in the States, you know, the migration often happens for UAC mm-hmm. from Central America to the U.S. And, that, you know, in some ways it's a very similar journey in terms of, you know, the role of smugglers to, you know, mm-hmm. Move, mm-hmm. move young people, you know, through multiple countries and eventually to the border. So you were talking about the, the process beginning to open up in Hungary. Mm-hmm. Go back to, you know, 2015-16. And I know at that point there were mainly families coming, Mm -hmm. but what did the process look like when the borders were open? As I mentioned, you know, it was in 2015 and beginning of 2016, people would go from from Greece or from Turkey to Bulgaria. They would reach Serbia. They would spend maybe, you know, a couple of hours in Belgrade just to, to buy the next train ticket or bus ticket. And then they would go to the border with Croatia because Info Park, as an organization started working on 15th uh, September of 2015. And that was the day that Hungary closed its border when Hungary, you know, erected this, this giant fence on the border. So from that time, you had, an, or you had organized buses and trains from border between Croatia and Serbia where people would come, they would be put on a train, and the next day they would be in, in Germany or Austria. So people were, were moving really fast and there were like thousands of people every day going through to Belgrade. And then slowly at the end of 2015, first they introduced, the authorities introduced something called control. So they would let only Syrians, Iraqis and Afghans cross, and then they would push other people back. And then slowly, you know, it was only Syrians and Iraqis, and then they would let only Syrians. And then in March 2016, they, they stopped all completely. And then looking forward, and you said that the process was starting to reopen, you know, what do you think that the process will look like, you know, once, you know, hopefully coronavirus, you know, the pandemic comes to an end? I don't think it will reopen again, because this system, you know, Hungary is the only one who is accepting refugees from Serbia right now. One person per day, I think it was, you know, it was designed to completely discourage anyone from trying to go to go legally, because there are other tricks. When you are accepted into Hungary, you know, you come, you wait for three years, you're accepted there. You need to seek asylum there in Hungary, which, again, most people, they, they don't really want to stay in Hungary. They want to go to Western Europe, you know. So you need to seek asylum there, hope that you're going to be accepted. And because the entire time you're going to stay in a closed camp, closed center, detention center, and you're going to stay there indefinitely, you know, as long as your asylum procedure is ongoing. And then Hopefully, if you're accepted, they will transfer you to some open camp. And then most people, they just, you know, they just run away from the open camps. They take the first bus or train to Germany or Austria, and then they go. But it it doesn't happen because you have also age assessment. You have different factors, you know. If you, because when you reach Serbia, you need to go through Greece or Bulgaria. And there are also European Union countries. 
and most of the people who are intercepted there, they were taken for registration or fingerprints or things like this. So there are other, you know, by Dublin Convention, if you have your fingerprints taken in the first uh, European Union country, the other countries like Austria, for example, they can deport you back to this country and you need to seek asylum there. So there are a lot of tricks. I don't think the system is it's, the system is completely discouraging. You know, for everyone who wants to go legally, you know, your chances are very slim. It's going to be very slow, and there's a lot of uncertainties. You know, so the the current system, the only thing that it does is support you know illegal migrations and smugglers and human traffickers. Yeah. Yeah, in the U.S., I often say that you know we've outsourced our our immigration system to cartels and smugglers. Yes, this is what we've seen in Belgrade since 2016. Smuggling has been blooming and blooming. And once a UAC reaches Hungary or an EU country, Mm -hmm. are there any special protections for a UAC? Uh, Yes. In Europe, yes. You have different kind of accommodation facilities. Uh, You have different kinds of protection, support during your your trial and things during your procedure until you turn 18. And that is when everything stops. You know, we had cases where in some Western European countries, as soon as an accompanying minor turned 18, they were deported back to their own countries. So this also pushes, the only thing it does is pushes, you know, these young boys into hiding or staying on the streets or staying, you know, illegally or doing illegal jobs and things like this. Mm -hmm. But that also speaks to a reason why Hungary is not even, is not letting anybody in whether they mm-hmm. are a minor or an adult. Mm-hmm. Once a minor gets, you know, is able to enter Hungary, they have access to these these other protections. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then so do you feel like the community that is in Belgrade now understands, kind of sees the challenge ahead? And, and you know, so how are people reacting to just the fact that for all intents and purposes, they're, they're stuck? Uh, so the people who, who reach Belgrade in Serbia... The, the entire way until up until now, they have been tra- traveling mostly with smugglers, you know. So mm-hmm. at first instance, they, they're going to trust smugglers more than they trust us. And there's a lot of misinformation. Smugglers often, you know, lie to them on purpose. They say the borders are open. You can go freely. You can sit on a bus and go and things like this just to, you know, take more money and things like this. And then when they reach Serbia, they see that it's actually not like this. So it's difficult to, to handle the entire situation to, because people are, especially young boys, they are under so much pressure from their own families, from their own communities in the countries of origin to continue further, to, to you know, keep trying. They call it, uh, in Serbia, there's a term that it's the, the refugees and migrants, they say game when you try to go and cross the border. So they're going to keep going and going and going and trying to cross because under they are under so much pressure, you know, you've across all this way you reach up until now you're you know one border away from european union and you need to keep trying and trying and this is what exposes them to so much you know so many risks and dangers and you know consequences consequences of of these kind of travels and the work that you do every day do you see stories of you know youth or adults who come to terms with that and find another path to prosper and, and survive, in, whether it's in Serbia or somewhere else? Well, there is a small percentage of people who actually want to seek asylum in Serbia and decided to seek asylum and stay in Serbia. But those are mostly people who are, whose financial situation is better than the rest. You know, in their countries of origin, they are not, they are not expected to, you know, go and reach Germany and send money back to their own families, you know. So in those cases where people just want safety, yeah, we had cases of one of our colleagues, for example, he's a young guy who came here as a minor and then he, because he speaks many languages, he came and he started volunteering and working as translator and he got his asylum and everything. But that's very, very low percentage of people because most of them are, besides, you know, safety, they're looking for a better life and they have families who are pressuring them to, you know, continue their journey and to, you know, reach Europe and work and earn money and then send money back, especially when they have to pay back the smugglers. And then who are the partners that Infopark is working with, you know, whether it's in Serbia or even at the international level? You know, describe to me kind of the, the network of organizations that are all working to try to address this challenge. So in Serbia, you have a Commissariat for Refugees and Migration. They're the only governmental institution 
that handles uh, the, the immigrations in Serbia. So they are in charge of all the asylum and reception centers. And then beside, beside the commissariat, you have Center for Social Welfare. They are uh, in, every, in every city you have Center for Social Welfare and they are um, in charge of protection of minors. And then you have you know, Ministry of Interior Affairs, which is mostly police and border police. And then you have NGOs and international NGOs who are working kind of to fill in the gaps and help the, the system handle this, this whole crisis. And when you when you look at the news around the world about mm-hmm. how migration is playing out, you know what, what do you what do you think? Like I don't know, I don't know if you've seen the the pictures or the stories of you know the U.S. Mexico border. What does that make you think of? Uh, it's it's very hard to see it, especially for someone like it, like me. I've been doing this job for more than five years now, and the only thing we've seen that the governments and other countries are treating refugees and migrants worse and worse and the entire policies are which are being made and made and all the decisions that are made are just making things worse and worse i remember in 2015 when we talk about media image and when we talk about other things uh, related to refugees everyone would, was still calling them refugees and someone we should help and try to support and then slowly from 2015 to 16 they were not refugees anymore they were migrants and then now in 2020, where the, the most of the images we see in media are very negative ones, so they're not even refugees anymore. They are, uh, they're not even migrants anymore. They are economic migrants or even worse, you know, terrorists or rapists or things like this. So when you see these, the, you know, how things progress over the years, it's not very, it's not very encouraging. You know? It doesn't give you much hope. So then what do we need to do to, to begin to turn around these stories? I think that for, first of all, we need to understand that those are people looking for a uh, better life. Those are people like you and me to stop looking at them the, like numbers or statistics or things like this, because people do tend to forget that those are people with their own stories, with their own experiences, with their own dreams, you know, with their own hopes. And those are the same like you and me, people, just people. And then after, when we when we realize that, I think that we should really work, try and work hard on creating a system that's adequate for the refugees and migrants, especially for the children, children on the move system that can actually protect them and ensure that their human rights are protected. You know. So, I mean, you said when you look around the world and the way that governments are acting on these issues, it doesn't give you a lot of hope, but... I just have to. I have to believe that if you've been doing this work for five years, you're you're getting hope from somewhere. Uh, so so where is that place, Irina? Well, yeah, as someone who's you know in the in the field every day and working directly with people, you can see how much it means to them when you make things a little bit easier. You know, although we cannot help everyone and we cannot reach everyone, the people that we do manage to reach and and help, you can see the difference and you can see the change and you can see someone who reaches Serbia as a victim of smuggling and as a victim of physical or sexual violence or exploitation. And then after a while, when they had some time to, you know, recover from their own trauma and had some time in, in support and support mechanisms, you see someone who is learning languages, who is interested in different things. You, have, you see someone who's starting to go to school again, workshops, who is uh, inspiring other young children, for example, to learn and to do you know to do better and to avoid risks to avoid risky situations to try and solve conflicts you know in a positive way and deal with this whole situation in a positive way when you have the chance to see that then it makes it you know all the hard work it makes it worthwhile do you see yourself in in some of those stories and and your own story yeah yeah definitely i was you know when i think about this whole crisis and when i look back into the past, like when my family arrived as refugees, I think they had no idea that their child 20 years from now would be helping some other refugees, you know. And when I think about future, it makes me wonder what will be in 20 years from now, you know, will maybe my child be helping some other refugees or will my child be a refugee and, you know, then dependent on some other people's child, you know, how we gonna how we gonna raise future generations? Are we gonna raise them as someone who is helping others, someone who is understanding, or are we gonna raise them, you know, to build walls and to look the other way and to treat people different? So usually my final question for people is, you know, wrapped around the name of the podcast only in America. So I'm gonna ask you kind of a twist on that question. 
and the question is just a request to finish this sentence. And in this mm -hmm. case, it'll be only in Serbia. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. There are a lot of things when it comes to this crisis and this, you know, migration and everything. There are a lot of things that are specific just to Serbia. I think only in Serbia because. Unfortunately, we've had a history of wars and refugees from, from you know, years ago, from 90s and even before that. Only in Serbia we were able to understand the refugees and to correlate and to try and offer, you know, help and support along the way. Because we've been in that position and we understand how difficult it can be to, you know, to, to try and start your life from beginning. Irena, thank you so much for your time. and. and uh... Uh, Thank you so much for um, for everything that you do and everything that InfoPark does. Um, we're just terribly grateful. You're welcome, and thank you for for you know taking interest in in this topic because it doesn't happen often. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's such a big topic, and it's you know it, mm -hmm. there's so many parallels between what the work that you're doing, the community that you're serving, and you know what's happening you know in Mexico at the at the U.S. Mexico border. And I just think that we've got to we've got to draw these parallels and then you know, begin to understand what the solutions are because you know, in some ways the solutions are very similar too. Uh, yeah, definitely. Because when you look at the things that are different, like, okay, there are different countries and they, are different, they can have different cu cultural backgrounds and things like this. But when you look at the needs, they are the same everywhere, especially for, you know, uh, unaccompanied children. They, the needs are same everywhere. The need to be safe, the need to be protected, to be respected, to, the need to, you know, have have a chance at your own life and your own future, the needs are the same. doesn't matter where you are in this, in this world. Irena Abdelalam Abdel Makshud is a protection officer and unaccompanied and separated children specialist at InfoPark, an NGO based in Belgrade, Serbia. And I want to thank our friends at Church World Service for the introduction to InfoPark and both the work that Church World Service and InfoPark does every single day. You can learn more about Irena and the incredible work of InfoPark at our website, immigrationforum.org slash podcast. And if you like what you hear, subscribe to Only in America wherever you're listening to this episode. Thank you so much for listening to Only in America in 2020. We hope you have a safe and restful holiday. And please stay tuned for a look at what's ahead for immigration in our new season premiering in January. Only in America is produced by an incredible team that I physically have not seen since March. And that team is Joanna Taylor, Megan Wetmore, and Becca Wall. And our artwork and graphics are designed by Carla Leha. It's a great team that I see almost every day via Zoom and I hope to see you again sometime in 2021. I'm Ali Nirani. Have a wonderful holiday. Have a happy new year. And I will talk to you next year.